What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, check out past episodes. You know, some of my favorites are so many. The, the founder of Atari came on um, and Chris Voss came on. If you haven't heard anyone out there has entered the book, Never Split the Difference. He's an uh, ex-FBA hostage negotiator, which is specific to this interview talking about security. And, you know, he basically talked talk about his stories negotiating with terrorists um, hostage situations. It was crazy. Um, also check out with Chris Atageka, one of my favorite interviews of all time, founder of two nonprofits, two for-profits. He grew up in Uganda, seven years old. He became an orphan because both of his parents died of AIDS being the oldest of five children. And he became head of the household. And there's just so many amazing stories of him actually winning a scholarship to come to the U S he speaks nine languages and ending up getting his PhD at Berkeley, um, and so check out that episode with Chris Atageka, just really inspiring. And before I talk about today's guests who are all, you know, equally inspiring, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is at Rise 25, we help businesses give to their best relationships and connect to their dream 100 partnerships and give to their relationships in their network, um, by helping you run your podcast. And that's what we do because, you know, I have uh, John and Dr. Dene- you know, Dr. G here. Um, the number one thing in my life is relationships, hands down. And so I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships and the thought leadership. So if any of you out there have thought about starting a podcast, um, that's what we do. And we're the easy button for people. Go to rise25.com and check it out. And before introducing today's guest, I want to just a big thank you to two people, Lindley White, um, has over 25 years of experience in corporate communications, and she actually began her career in the White House. She introduced me to Shante Robinson, um, who connected with me, these amazing people. Uh, Shante, if you don't know, is VP of commercial banking for JP Morgan Chase and in the Bakes Midwest lead for diversity and inclusion. And she helps drive innovative programs and pathways, and she helps middle-sized companies with a variety of financial services. So if you have questions, you can check her out. And today, without further ado, we have co-founders of the largest black owned security firm in the nation. Um, really, uh, John and Dr. G, I think of it, when I think of your story, um, you know, it's, it's a true amazing story from single mother homes to starting in a basement to over a thousand employee staff to a multi-million dollar complex that you serve and you educate your staff and help other businesses. And for people who don't know who you are, AGP Investigative was founded as an investigative firm in 2001 by the husband and wife team in front of me, Dr. Denitra and John Griffin. Their mission is to eliminate economic inequities by delivering training and smart services by protecting your people, your property, and your data. And they expanded their business to provide a suite of security options, which we'll talk about because it's interesting how you expand a service, right? And going physical and cybersecurity and private investigation and the education training, which I talked about. And you know, this is not a proper introduction without talking about what AGB stands for, which is always giving back. And they have a foundation right. that offers business internships, college scholarships to young people. Their services include all of the things I mentioned. So thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, there's so many places we could start with this. <laughs> and I like to start in the beginning because, you know, humble beginnings are always inspiring. And I listened to the episode you guys did with each other um, and talked about some of those those humble beginnings and not having uh, like a role model following a pathway, right? And so talk about, you know, each of you, you're growing up like from a young age. What did you each want to be from a young age? Well, I've, I, you know, shared publicly that when I was growing up, my, my um, point of reference was my mother um, and whatever she did or whatever she demonstrated, I was enamored with, with her position and I wanted to be like my mom. And so at that time, my mom was a bank teller. So I clearly remember having to do an assignment for school. What do you want to be when you grow up? 
and a bank teller was my desire. But as I grew older, um, you know, and kind of went outside the perimeter of my community, which included my school, my church, and my friends, my neighbors, mm -hmm. um, I saw that there were other professions and other people um, that I can inspire um, to grow and, and model myself after. But at a very young age, my mother was my point of reference. Who she was was who I wanted to be. Um, and that's why it's so important that we provide access and opportunities right. to, you know, the underserved or marginalized communities, because you clearly can probably only dream as big as what's in front of you. Totally. With me, um, my mom and dad divorced when I was five years old. Um, so my dad's been a part of my life. He's, he's a great guy. I love him. But my point of reference was really my uncles and my granddad, who we lived with. And those were the gentlemen who kind of helped me, shape me in terms of protection. Because we grew up, I was born in Robert Taylor, uh, CHA projects, and I was raised in Inglewood. And it's always been my uncles and my, and my uh, grandfather, who was the protectors, the examples, who would beat the bad guys up for me, you know, and made sure I stay on, on a straight and narrow. Uh, my father is a great man. And he's always been a part, but you know, he had married my stepmom, who I love dearly, and started another family. So, uh, those are my examples. What was life growing up in the Robert Taylor homes? What was that like? So I moved out in third grade, and don't, uh, I used to go to Coleman School. I remember that, <laughs> and I and I remember uh, it's been a community where we just we had fun. We used to go out there, we just run around and play. But I knew it was a place that my grandfather, my mom, wanted us to get out of. And they wanted to go somewhere we could have better schools and a better opportunity. So growing up there, it was nothing like it is now, the reputation it is now. It was still considered, I didn't know it was considered bad because I was right. third grade. So I'm like, you know. It's just we, your reality. A lot of uh, yeah. Right. So a lot of times, and I know I can speak for John and me because <laughs> I explained to John, like, I didn't realize I how poor. much I didn't have <laughs> right. until I went to college and I wondered why my roommates had like matching bath towels, you know, <laughs> and matching linen. I was like, you know, this is really nice. And so <laughs> I kind of took inventory. I was like, well, wait a minute. I was like, are we poor? Did I like grow up poor? <laughs> you don't so, realize at the time because it's, just, yeah. it's your reality. Yeah. It's my reality. And um, I think what, you know, one, one thing that John and I both shared, although we, lacked access and resources we were still filled with a lot of love a lot of love so you did protection and protection so yeah. you didn't realize what you didn't have because that's all you knew that's all you knew and it, 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 it was one episode when i went to um fun town you know fun town was a, was a great chicago fun town fun town for the kids and you it was like 95th to stony avenue so it was like stony island so fun town so we went there my mom took us there and I saw all these kids getting cotton candy and popcorn. My mom was like, well, I can't afford that. So you guys got to share cotton candy and share popcorn. And that was the point I realized, man, we, we must be poor because I, I want my own popcorn. <laughs> I'm all, you know, I want to get on all the rides. And uh, I remember that, you know, and, you know, that's why I became, you know, aware of mm -hmm. my situation financially. Yeah. I mean, oftentimes I find, you know, that's what drives like just a fire inside some of the entrepreneurs yeah. I talk to, which is just yeah. that moment. Like, I don't want, I want to give my kids as much popcorn as they want or, so, you know, some thought. Exactly. Like that. And that's what, that's what really drove me to really want to provide that for my children. And, and sometimes I give my kids too much. She says, you give them too much. So well, I was so poor. I wanted to make sure they had yeah. everything, you know, yeah. it's but a it tough good. balance, right? I mean, part of the reason that shaped both of you was your upbringing and probably your drive. And so how do you navigate that with kids? Right. I mean, I watched your, your son, one of your sons speak about you, John was like, I model my dad. He was in like a nice bow tie and he was just, yes. he was just saying, you know, I, my dad comes home. People don't see how hard he works yes. when he comes home. So how, I mean, you obviously have instilled that in your kids despite yes. giving oh, yes. them, yes. you know, giving them a lot. Yeah. Right? We, we, we hard work. My wife is unrelenting. She said that, uh, you know, you have to be able to uh, work hard for what you want and 
there are no accidents. You don't just become an A student. You don't just become a millionaire. You don't just be, you just grow a business out of osmosis. And she always taught our children, because she's the rock of our family, um, that you have to always give back and service to your community, service to others. Yeah. So we, we taught that to our kids. Yeah, daily, you know, I would ask them, you know, how did you make the world a better place today? <laughs> like you had to be able to respond to that. What did you do to make a difference? They would and, hate that. They would yeah. hate that. Oh, and uh, <laughs> to the point that even, you know, like when they were in school, I'm like, well, you know, what did you learn and what, how are you going to take what you learned to make an impact? And they'll say, oh, you know, I didn't learn anything. And then I'm like, oh, well, let me just call the principal and let the <laughs> principal know that you didn't learn anything. And they're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But it was, it's important that um, they understand, you know, that they have to make a contribution to society. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's our role to set you up for success, but you have I mean, it's just the, the, the life cycle. You have to put out what you get in. You that's have to right. put out. You got it. That's right. You're, and you're responsible for that. You, you are obligated to do that. Dr. G, you know, you know, you saw something in John, right? Yes. And there's a, is it, <laughs> you know, there is a really interesting story of how you came to be and met and dated and got married. But what did you see? Because you saw something. Well, yeah, I hear off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see that really made you gravitate towards him? Yeah. And so it was really interesting. So outside the, the initial attraction was was his appearance. Very well groomed, <laughs> nice dress with hair. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't wear glasses there. Yeah. But even after the conversation evolved, um, just a strong commitment to family. When I met my husband, I met his brother. And mm. he was in um, on my college campus in my dorm room and vehemently spoke about his brother. Wherever I go, my brother goes with me. Like I take care of my brother, you know, that's my best friend. And so I was really attracted to his um, commitment to family. And one thing that, another thing that John had that I was really impressed with was um, his understanding and awareness of black history. And so when I was growing up, um, I did not, unfortunately, I did not get history lessons that explained to me the life of African Americans before slavery. So all the years I grew up thinking that that was our history and having those type of conversations with John at a college level, you know, to just really tap into what I learned in high school African American history class, mm -hmm. you know, really attracted me to him because I felt like he can teach me something. Yeah. And so outside of the appearance, dedication to family and the black history, he had a job. <laughs> what was your job at the time? Mail so, Yeah, I didn't know it was the mail room oh. though. But back then, uh, so it was the early 90s. Yeah. And, you know, back then it was a big thing. And you can, you know, call somebody at their job. And when he said, oh, you know, you can call. Here's my work number. I was like, oh. I was like, girl, he can receive phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> His corner. Well, here's my corner job. office number. <laughs> Yeah. Right. right. He didn't tell me it was in the basement in the mail room. <laughs> but Small details. Hey. It's fine. You know, when I was listening to your story also, one of the things that stuck out, it was like a dagger when I first heard this line, Dr. G, that you said, actually. And I was like, oh, God, that like hurts. OK, I don't know if you know what I'm going to say right now, but you said to John, I feel sorry for you. So take me back to that time and what was going on. Yes. Yes. So we were, he was, at, I always say we, but so he was at a crossroad where um, he had to make a decision mm -hmm. if he was going to continue um, to pursue his career um, as a Cook County State's Attorney's <laughs> investigator, or if he was going to take the business full on. And a huge decision. Yes, very difficult. You know, I'm not a, a male and head of the household. So the um, it, it, it probably would have sat with me differently. 
So knowing his role in our family, he was at a crossroad. And, you know, I blame myself sometimes because I have more faith in people sometimes when they don't have the same amount of faith in themselves. And when he was conflicted, I was irritated that he was conflicted because <laughs> I'm mad at you because right? I'm mad because you don't because know. Yeah. I'm like, you know, you just don't know how great you are. Mm. And with you, you know, you pray every day. I see you pray every day. You practice your faith religiously. So where is all of that? And, you know, that's why I said, I feel sorry for you because you just don't know how great you are. Yeah. And so I see the guy to him. Mm. And, you know, when given the platform, the space and the timing, I know what he's capable of. Yeah. And John, he didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, John. So I want to hear your thoughts, because when I heard the first part, when I was listening to it, I feel sorry for my Oh, my. That's a <laughs> dagger to the heart. And then oh, and then you baby. say, because you don't know how great you are. I'm like, I don't even know how to take that. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. That's my mind doesn't comprehend. Yeah. You know, it's like it's a, a compliment yeah. right afterwards. So yeah. so, John, you know, my my initial reaction, probably if I heard that, I would be totally defensive yeah. if someone said that to me. Um, yeah. Well, I, she she took my soul. So I was like, oh, and I could I could have come back. And oftentimes, as uh, you know, she's my spouse and she's my uh, my life partner. She knows me better than I know myself. So when she said those words, she walked out and she went to work. And I sat there. That's a mic drop to, right there. Yeah, and that's I a mic drop. drop. I was on. out. You know, <laughs> she was out. She said, I feel sorry for you because you're not great. You're like that. So it just took me, had me do a lot of introspection. And I would just, you know, I sat there and I thought all day. And and when that uh, was said to me, it gave me the nudge that I needed to get going. So when she told me that, I said, well, I jacked my slacks. Because now I have to actualize what I've been teaching my boys and my girls about, you know, making tough decisions. And, and especially being a man, you make decisions and you live with them. And uh, it was time. So but, what was the first step that you took? So you said so that, I, Dr. G to John and John, you are like, OK, like I'm ready to go. Yeah, I'm ready to go. What so do you I, do I next? talked to her. I told her that I was going to go ahead and resign my career because I was almost at 20 years. I was I was trying to get a pension and all that stuff. And she's like, you know, and I was scared because AGB was not a stable business. It's making about 1.5 million or so. So it wasn't really a lot of money. And I was like, well, I'm not stable. I don't know if I'm going to survive this, you know, because uh, it's just tough, you know, running a business. And I was like, you know, and with a government job, you know, every two weeks you get paid regardless. And I knew mm -hmm. I had, my son was in high school. He's a, he was in a, a Catholic high school, De La Salle. I had a mortgage. I had children. And people depend on your dad. You know, yeah. dad is dad has to take care of his responsibilities. So um, I uh, talked to my my attorney, and we uh, wrote letter resignation, and I resigned. I was able to resign to, uh, in good standing, and get my uh, retirement credentials, and I had to look back. How I long just, were you running the business on the side while you were working full time? Nine and a half years. Yeah. Wow. A lot of years. a lot of work. You know, I would come home. Uh, I would go in my office. I would work. I would, uh, you know, hire people. To, yeah, to, we had a full staff. We yeah. had a full That's office. That's super impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot neither of, work. of us were there full time. <laughs> so there was a full-fledged office, receptionist people running, you know, directors. Um, yeah. we, I don't think we called them directors at yeah. that time, but... Yeah, it was it was an Before, office building man, with people, building, people officers, cars, That's yeah. a wild. you name it. And I was had to run that. And, you know, it was, it was, it was tough. It's yeah. tough. Dr. G, you were just like, listen, we built this. Let's just you you just saw it could grow so much faster. Like, just if, go for it. Yeah, know? because I knew um, security, the technical skills and security, he he mastered that. And so I knew it. I just knew it. And I knew if you put yourself, make a 100% commitment of yourself into the organization, I knew what it would go. I knew where it would go. Yeah. And I explained to John, I'm like, no one can outsell him. <laughs> no one can outsell him. So you go there, do that full time. I'll carry the insurance. I was still working 
um, for Chicago Public Schools. I'll carry the insurance and continue to, you know, support on the side. But you got it. And yeah. it man, the yeah. revenue tripled within a very short window. Yeah. yeah. But so you know, you, you tell yeah, you, you know, Doc, you your father, so you tell it to a man who has four miles looking at him, you know, and college in four years for the oldest boy. It's pressure. It's pressure. For sure. And I know, Dr. G, you have to hop off in a minute. And but I wanted to ask roles wise. So now you know, pr- things have probably evolved. Talk about your your individual roles. So for me, um, as the president of AGB, I really manage the day to day, really operationalizing the strategic plan, all of the PLs, the dashboard, the people, uh, making sure all processes and initiatives are cohesive. Um, and make sure that we're monitoring, um, you know, our cash flow, our EBITDA, our gross margins, um, just operationalizing the entire business. Yeah. And my job is as to her. <laughs> exactly. You know, you you marry, you like, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a funny story you tell, John, is uh, I think you were out put, taking the garbage out and you get a phone call from Dr. G. Yeah. And you're like, I just left the house. I just left the and house. I, I just left. The, I went to the, the curb, the roller garbage can out, and rolled back to the garage. Fall rain. She's like, hey. I'm like, I just left the I say, I just rolled the gar- I ain't got in my car yet. I love him so much. She's like, yeah, you know, we got you know, you know what this is. We got to talk. So I had to get in the car and talk all the way. To, <laughs> I had to talk all the way, you know. I said, I just got left the house. I just rolled the cop. The, 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 the garbage so cans. The garbage yeah. cans. Oh, my God. You know. Yeah, just case in point, you answer to her. You know, that's <laughs> that's how it goes. And, oh you know, goodness. but as a CEO, what I do is uh, uh, vision. Yes. You know, we're building a, a SOC, a security operations center. And I am creating. And they just said, John, I need you to create. Yes. I need for you to create because you're a creator. And then we'll make it happen on this yes. level. So it's not just so much of me creating. It's now it has evolved to what we're creating. Yeah. He's my wife transformational. Is, yeah, my wife He's is transformational. Yeah, she's an equal partner. Yeah. So I say, hey, I want to build a school. Hey, I want to build a sock. Yes. Hey, I want to, this is the growth strategy. And now it's more like, yeah, we're doing that, but what's in your mind? Yeah. Because she's also great. You know, and, and together we just, we just about something. Powerhouse. Like yeah. And, and Dr. J, I know whenever you need to pop yeah. off, hop off, I want to talk about values and culture. Like, you know, Culture is huge for you. Hiring is huge for you. I'm wondering, what do you look for? Talk about the hiring process. A bit. Yeah. So uh, all my people, all our people, Doc, that we hired, um, we know that none of us was born to sit in these seats. You know, I've never been a CEO of a thousand men, licensed 15, 16 states. You know, I never did this before. So my only criteria is not only integrity and morals, but are you open to better? And if you are open to better, then we can teach you what you need to know. And most positions in AGB, internal and external, we had to grow within. And now that we're, we're bigger and we bring a lot of talent in, you know, or consultants in, you know, to help us to go places we haven't been before. But those are, you know, you gotta have integrity, hardworking, and, uh, you know, it's morals. Because you're going to be exposed to a lot. And we, we want to make sure that you grow in your, in your role. How would you look for when you're in the hiring process? Because sometimes people put their best foot forward. What are you looking for in that interview process to make sure, okay, this person's open to better and they have integrity that you want to be in, on the same team with? Yeah. So what we do is that we, 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 it's a feeling that I get, you know, my gut feeling. This is, I'm, I'm speaking on, um, a senior management position because I don't know, you know, the officers and that stuff pushed down on a lower level. But um, at the niche in our position, we spend a lot of time recruiting people that we believe that would be comfortable in our, you know, in our group because you got to be able to, because we're very parochial. You know, the senior leadership team is very parochial. It's like this, you know. So we ask them uh, scenario questions. We give them tough questions to answer about how would you respond to this. Tell me about uh, a difficult situation you, you had to deal with and how you 
how you go about to so look, look at their mind process, how they work. And you can tell script from reality. A person has been authentic, they've been passionate, you can tell. Or is it script? If, if they're just, just trying to put on fluff to get the job, Doc. And that's how I can tell if these people are really, you know, um, where, and then we bring a leadership team in. And leadership team interviews the people. And then they get, and we step out and let them get there and have them interview the individual and see if they are, you know, apropos for our, our, our team. Yeah, if you watch, if anyone watches the videos, there's some videos of kind of like showing some of the, the training that you guys do. And it seems very extensive. Absolutely. Talk about some of the, you know, the background of the people that help put that, that together. I think they're part of your leadership team. I was reading on, you have like U.S. Marines on the team, you know, on Absolutely. the staff and we other. Retired. Yeah. These guys were, cause my background is law enforcement. So I went through, you know, I was a state, state attorney detail of the secret service, uh, you know, worked in and went to detective school, CPD, Chicago police department. I went through the shared department. I went through regular police academies. So all this training, I, I gathered and I knew I've been to four or five academies. Um, and I knew that I needed to make sure that I bring my security officers, not guards, to a certain level. And I knew that the, along that journey, Doc, I met people that was in the academies or was instructors. And we became colleagues and friends. So when they retired, I said, hey, we're doing a 16-week academy for our you know, security. Can you do you mind come back and teaching our guys mm. how to properly shoot, how to start a, a, a special response team, how to take down people, how to how to use verbal judo? So that was very important to me. So what I did yeah. was I brought all those people together. I even brought in retired U.S. Secret Service agents to, to talk to us about how you do uh, protection, instead of protection, protecting uh, people. You know, different things. So that was very good. So these guys got. Top notch training. Yeah. That's not normal training in it's not the normal industry. training, no, sir. Yeah. No, sir. That's what separates HB from anybody else. I think the way we treat our people and our training and our yeah. technology. Those are very important uh, mechanisms. Talk about a story you're especially proud of that some you know, someone from the company kind of warded off like a dangerous situation because of the training. Oh my what, God. What's uh what's uh, something that, that sticks out to you? So we were um, at one of the, uh, our, I won't name your name. Yeah, you don't have to that. name names. Exactly. Yeah, I won't name your name. But we were, at, we were actually doing interviews at one of our major um, clients. And there was a shootout. Mm, wow. Shootout, right? Like 10 feet from us. Because, you know, we work in a lot of dangerous areas in Chicago. My officers, we were sitting around and we've been interviewed by the media. And when the gunshots rang, my officers took action. They just, we were able to, long story short, apprehend assailants, recover guns, and took him down. And it was all on film because the, the film crew was actually filming what happened. And because you never believe security company was able to respond like that. Um, those kind of stories. Uh, none of my clients on the federal level, we were hired um, at the highest level of federal government. I can't name any names. We were in um, a very sensitive uh, situation where some information could have gotten out if we had not found it, took it to the proper authorities, um, and made sure that things were safe. We were, our job was to protect the perimeter from any leaks, and we were able to do that successfully. It could have been catastrophic, you know, so we were able to do that. John, talk about the evolution of the offerings, right? How yes, did it, what was it, what did it start? And then you, when did you add on the different yes, services? So yeah, 2001, it was an investigative company. You know, I, you know, uh, subpoenas, um, witness locates, witness interviews, things like that. Um, I was told by one of my colleagues in the industry, hey, you know, you really need to get a security license because you could begin to make more money because investigation is very uh saturated as is security, but as you have more offers, you can do both. So I went to get license that security. I added security officers. And then from there, hey, you know, you really need to add fingerprinting because fingerprinting, live scan fingerprinting is really, is really good. You need to add that because you, you want to be all things to everybody. So we added live, live scan. And then, hey, you know, as a security company agency, you should do your own training, your own arm on arm training. So we got certified to do on arm arm training. Then hey, you need to add concealed carry. 
because that's 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 what's hot. And then we grew the train division into AGB Institute. And then, um, hey, you need to really add a, a, a security school, you know, because you need to have a school that's going to be able to not only teach people internally, but offer soft skills, active shooter, uh, workplace violence, uh, terrorism threats, uh, very basic Microsoft skills, you know, PowerPoint, Word, all that. So we did that. So we, we began. But my growth plan was always cybersecurity. Because while the Secret Service Task Force, I was in forensics. I did uh, forensics, computer forensics. And I knew that that's where it was, you know, security was evolving to more of a cyber. So I went to I went through the Goldman Sachs program. I was in Chicago, the first uh, cohort in Chicago. And I learned, I wrote, I wrote a plan about how to develop a cyber company. And we started moving toward that. So we everything to everybody. So we are now a complete company from the virtual to the physical. So people give me an example, data. John, of like a cybersecurity. You don't have to name names or anything, but what what's a common thing that you'd have to deal with, or maybe you know, just to give people an idea, when you say cybersecurity, what is a company trying to, or very what are basic. some of the attacks that that happen? Oh my God, very basic. How about starting from the desktop? With, with, with virus definitions, uh, vulnerabilities, um, monitoring the networks, reporting, you know, network packets that, that appear to be or maybe been, been watched or there's something on the network, penetration testing, all that. So we've had clients that come to us and say, listen, I believe uh, I've, I was a victim of, um, I've been hacked. And we first, we go to their computer, we found out they have no definitions, no virus protectors on the computer. <laughs> you know, there's nothing that's meant. So now someone enter the computer and go throughout the whole network. How do you get rid of that? So we had a lot of clients, a lot of small, a lot of Got dental it. companies, dental, dental offices, medical offices, you know, just small companies. Yeah. So, you know, getting them ready and understanding, you know, to be intelligent about your uh, cyber needs. I see what you mean. So, for an example, let's say a company comes and say, John, we need your help. You may have, you know, officers on premises watching right. and then you're like, well, listen, are you protecting your infrastructure? No. Okay. We can provide the cybersecurity. And then if you want, they want a whole view. I think I, I was reading that you even have like drones or that you deploy you, you things drones. like that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My so son, John how does that work? Third. Yeah, my son, John Gifford III, is uh, a couple of people are licensed drone pilots, uh, part 107 drone pilots. And because people and clients want drones, sometimes you can have a more area of view. You can, you, you know, and speak back to the security officers on the ground. Hey, you know, mount this way, there's a there's a potential game war going on, or there's, there's some guys that look nefarious. So this will give you opportunity to go check. So my light, my light just went out. It's on the timer. Uh, there we go. So we, we try to make security, sure. and you're like low key. The lights go out. Like <laughs> yeah. so it's triggered by moment. words. You say right. drone, the lights go down. No. <laughs> <laughs> so all that. So really, Doc, from the virtual to the physical, we do the whole thing. Wow. And these guys, you know, these guys I have working with me are former uh, special agents, are retired, uh, you know armed forces and they know cybersecurity. They know security. Is it that else? is cool. Wow. Like you could really see a lot. I'm sure like the stuff that you record and see is totally private to that company, but Absolutely. I'm sure you've seen way too much. Um you know <laughs> no, no with, idea with um just sur- you know the surveillance that you do. Yes. Your company does. Yes, you have no idea, sir. We've seen a lot. But we've been involved in, I can show you films, we've been involved in hostage um, incidents with the backup CPD. And we went mm-hmm. in, it's on film, and the CPD also said, hey, you know, when AGB came back, backed us up, we knew we were, we, we were okay. They act like the police, they trained, they understood yeah. how to approach the protocol. So Yeah, you have to work closely with, with all of those organizations, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I want to talk about hiring and culture because there's a few 
um, people that you've hired. I love you to highlight. But before we do, I know you're a big fan of quotes. And so I'd love for you to share a few of your favorite quotes and some of the, the people who said those quotes, some of your you know mentors, whether they're in-person mentors or, or distant mentors. Right, right, so, right, right. So I love quotes also. So yeah. what are some of your favorites? Well, one is success is not an accident. Success is intentional. Muhammad Ali. Um, that's, that's very important. I teach my, I tell my team, you know, we don't just accidentally become successful. There's work, you know, uh, Tiger Woods talk about the short game. You know, everybody hit the ball 400 yards, but it's the short game. Short game for me is been excellent in my details. See, that's what happens. You have a team that does big things. Well, what about the small things is most important. So we deal with that. Um, uh, yeah. So many, so many, uh, no backward steps. Uh, meaning, you know, even when we make mistakes and we fail, those are more valuable nuggets than our successes. Mm. You know, so we, we, we put those, uh, those positive affirmations in our daily life. And, you know, we do an autopsy, you know, we, we fail, we, we get together. Okay. What happened? What did we learn? How are we going to improve? That's what good companies does, you know? And we really look at uh, Steve Jobs. He said that, you know, we don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. We hire smart people to tell us what to do. You know, mm. so we, you know, we, we saw so I hire you. I got to trust you to do your job. So if I got it, if I can't trust you and you're a smart person and you're supposed to do this and I'm teaching you, then we're in a, you're in the wrong seat. You know, so those are the really cool things that I believe in. Do you have any favorite, I'd love to hear uh, any favorite leadership or business books um, oh that like, that I'd love to hear about? John Johnson, um, John Johnson, um, the founder of, you know, Soft Sheen, BT, uh, Soft Sheen Jet, uh, Succeeding Against the Odds, um, uh, T.D. Jakes, uh, I'm a big fan of T.D. Jakes, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of Pastor T.D. Jakes, oh my no. God. Um uh, he's, 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 his, his business acumen is off the charts. Hmm. Um, who else we read? We, we're doing a, uh, we're doing a, 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 my wife is doing a, have us do a leadership cycle now. And we read, uh, books on, um, the book, I can't, it escapes me, but the book we're reading right now is dealing with, um, uh, serving leadership. Hmm. And that's what we really doing. We went on a retreat. We told our senior team, you got to service, you have to service your people. How do you do that? So we all don't leave system where we read a book and we get together every month mm. and we talk about the chapters and we want to see it in action. Yeah. So we do stuff like that. But yeah, those those were uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, uh, which is my idol, his books on, you know, Callous on My Soul and things like that. Uh, these are great motivational books because these guys came from my community, so I can relate to those guys. Mm -hmm. Uh my wife read, you know. Iger, uh, I think it's, you know, the Walt Disney CEO. Oh, the Bob Iger? Iger, yeah, Bob Iger. Yeah. She loves Bob Iger. She reads all this stuff, you know. So she's reading books. And we share. We share. Um, I read Principles by uh, that 800-page book. I can't forget the author's name, but it, it was very good. He's a billionaire. So Is I that read Ray that. Dalio? Ray Dalio? Ray Dalio. Yeah. Ray, Ray Dalio. Yes, love Ray Dalio. I read uh, Call Me Ted, Ted Turner, CNN founder. Just call me Ted. I read his books. Um, man, I read so much because that's how I learn. That's how you learn. Yeah. When's your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I've been asked to write a book, doc. I've been asked to write a book, but yeah. you know, doc, I'm telling you, this is very difficult because you're uh, busy. You have a thousand, you're a over thousand a thousand days, staff, you know, but it's fun. You know, we know for a thousand people and it's fun and we're, we're building our portfolio. We're building the sock. And we just we roll it, but I will one day get to it writing a book. Yeah, good. Uh, I'll buy it. I'll read it. I'll <laughs> spread the word on it. But um, right. I wanted to talk about um, Willie Odom. Yes, Willie Odom came to AGB as a ten dollar an hour employee. Willie Odom was a member of the Gangster Disciples Street mm -hmm. Gang. Willie Odom came to AGB with braids in his head, and you know, with the different color rubber bands, sagging pants. Um, and I said to him, are you open to better? He said, yes. So Willie Odom, I said, well, if you want to do better, 
let's first clean you up. Because in my community, Doc, and security being low better entry, people come in any kind of way, you know, looking very unkept, unclean. And that's not my model, my brand. So when I told them that your uniform, your appearance must command respect. And you can't look like the average Joe because you're different. And being a member of AGB means different. There's opportunity for you. Will he cut his hair? Will he start dressing nice? Will he start being on time? He's been, I, I gave him things to read. Uh, so read these books about uh, all these African-American men who came from nothing. So that's an excuse because I came from the projects. So let's get rid of that. So will you, will you talk about you came from? I've been there. Um, Wooly began, I, I noticed that Wooly was very good with numbers and his writing ability was, stu was stupendous. I said, well, you learn how to write, Wooly. He said, well, I always wrote and read. So we talked about polishing his writing skills a little bit more. Wooly took that on and Wooly began to rise through the ranks. Wooly makes six figures today. Hmm. Wooly met his wife at AGB. Wooly has two cars, a home in the suburbs. He has three children who are doing, doing well. Wooly been me for 12 years and one of my wow. superstars. Amazing. So Wooly is doing well. How soon when you met him, was it right away when you, that, that he basically, that you said, are you open to doing better and you made some suggestions or did it take a little while to break through for him to start to make those changes? Well, I, when I, when I saw him, we had, uh, we had, uh, my wife was doing uh female starry children. She was doing a fundraiser. She was doing the raise money for kids and packing food. So I came to my staff and says, Hey, you guys, we're, we're at this high school on the South side of Chicago, packing meals for kids. And you should come out. Willie was one of four people that came out out of, at the time, 50 employees, Willie came out. Hmm. He's moving to track the trailer. He's involved. And I, I said, hmm, okay, for him to take that on, the volunteer. He's on taking his own the initiative. Day, and then he's okay. Oh, you come back? Oh, she's back. Awesome. <laughs> so Willie, um, Willie Odom took that on. So I was telling about Willie Odom when I first noticed it's Female Sorry Children. You did that, Female Sorry Children. Oh, and Willie was there. He's working the tractor, putting the things up. Oh, wow. So I said, this guy, he volunteered. He volunteered, you remember? So I took Willie and I said, I'm going to help you. And he began to buy into the AGB way, the cleanness, the grooming, the writing ability, to understand how to do security. And he's been with me for almost mm -hmm. 12 years now. Yeah. He's the director. He manages a team of about, I mean, you know, he has... His portfolio is a little over two million. Yeah, little two. We're not no. When she when he take over the other oh. contest, about four million. Yeah, about four million. Yeah. yeah, So he's um he's doing well. He's got a wife. Uh, his wife was a lieutenant working here, so he met her on one of the sites he managed. Mm. So and we have a you know no fraternizing unless you go to HR and say hey I'm dating her. <laughs> so you know that way we know it's, and it keeps down open. any legalities. So he yeah. came. He declared. The HR, hey, I'm dating this woman, and they, I think we married them before they were ready to be yeah. married. <laughs> you married them, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Willie was the one who really, who came in and uh, really um, took advantage of. Are you over to better? Yeah, I mean, from the get go, you know, people judge other people very quickly, and when he walked in, in the beginning, you saw through. Like you mentioned, he had a certain look and a certain way he dressed and a certain way he acted. What did you see in him to say, yeah, we're, we're going to hire this person? Because I, I bet there's other companies that wouldn't have hired that person. Yeah, he spoke well. And he came in and uh, at the time I was, was involved in, I was involved in those, that lower hiring because it was the hiring of officers. And when I told him, I said, when he came in with the earrings and the, 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 the you know, the braided hair and and the sag, I said, brother, you know, you can't, you know, uh, you know, he's a big guy. So I said, you know, we need big guys in security, you know. And I said, I need for you to be open to getting your hair cut. He said, yes, I will. I will. Mm. You know, and I, I, I want a job. I want to be able to take care of my family. Got it. I want to be able to do things. And I think he had a daughter at the time, just one daughter. Mm -hmm. And so and maybe when, if he reacted differently, maybe if he said, no, you know, well, you crazy. I'm not going to cut my hair. Then it may have gone. It may have gone differently. Yeah, he was open to changing. 
Remember, Doc, when we first started, I told you that, you know, your integrity and morals, are you open to better? Yeah. Because we can teach you what you need to know. We can teach you here. We have a, a program, a curriculum. We can teach you how to be a civilized man and woman. We can teach you that. But if you're not open to it. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, Raja. Rajay. 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 Rajay, welcome. Rajay, beautiful young lady. Rajay, welcome. Uh, started with us as a temp. Just, we were, um, it was seven years ago, and we had a lot of, um, we had to do a lot of uh, converting over to uh, our files into virtual. So she just graduated with her master's degree. So she's already a civilized woman graduate, um, but she couldn't find a job. So we said, we need somebody to come in and, and we had a temp service come in, just scan documents, all the employees' files up into the cloud. Not the cloud, it was the server at the time. Mm -hmm. was no cloud then, it was the server. We came and we saw Rijay working very digitally, always on time, always um, professional. Um, my wife took a liking to her. They belong to the same sorority. So mm -hmm. um, we, we call her our daughter. Um, and we met her parents and her parents, we had a, we had a, a, a party or something mm -hmm. and a mother and her father came and mm -hmm. we was telling them how fun we are, their daughter. She's a good young lady. Well, today, rajay has been with us almost seven years. Mm -hmm. She runs, she's a manager of procurement. She met her husband here, mm -hmm. who, who is the finance, uh, the payroll um, manager, mm -hmm. a payroll um, and they're getting married. They're getting married in New Year's, in, Year's, in New Year's Eve. Eve this year. Wow. Getting married this Amazing. Eve. And yeah. she's already, she, she's a superstar. She's She runs all procurement. So contracting, uh, proposals, um, she's in on some of the presentations. So she does all that, federal, state, and local. So she's very skilled at yeah. that now. Thanks for sharing both those stories. And I want to talk about always giving back as far as the internships and scholarships. But before I ask it, you know, Dr. G, when you were gone, John and I were talking about his favorite leadership books and business books. And so I love for you to share a few of yours. And I, and he was mentioning you do kind of like not really a book club, but almost like a training for the leadership staff. So if you could share some of the, the your the favorites. And, I told him about you and becoming, Bob Iger. Though. Be, becoming the best. Becoming the best by yeah, Harry Kramer. Harry Kramer. Mm -hmm. So that's a good book. Um, that that's that's the book that we're gonna read. Have a professional learning cycle where we're not just reading the book, but we'll actually um, observe each other, um, implementing strategies and techniques that the book has um, articulated as best practice. So tell me about your books. Though. You want to know? Oh, books. so one of one of my favorite books. Um, well. The root of my favorite readings are um, Mara Collins' Way, hmm. which is this African-American educator um, who was well-renowned in the 70s and just a strong advocate for the underserved. And so I use that really as an inspirational book. Um, another one of my favorite reads is Oprah Winfrey, The Path Made Clear. Um, really understanding where you fit in the life cycle and your purpose and extrapolating your purpose into practice. Um, one of my books that have become my favorite reads for 2020 was Strategize to Win by Dr. Carla Harris. Hmm. And so because of John and my role, oftentimes we are mentors by default. Man. And so Man. <laughs> um, that book by Dr. Carla Harris is a really good read. I tell all of my mentees to read it, especially those that are just graduating from college. Read the first two chapters, it's gonna change your life. <laughs> I told my Bob Iger. Bob Iger, um, I think it was The Road to Win or something like that, but of course he's the ex-CEO of um, mm -hmm. Disney. You know, and he really talks about having that internal drive and that relentless pursuit of perfection um, that you have to have as a leader and, of course, as an entrepreneur. So those are some of my favorites. Um, you know, the Harry that gives Kramer. a lot of people to chew on, yeah. I'm sure. How, 
that gives a lot for people to chew on. I love those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wrote them all down. I'm a uh, avid reader, so I asked oh, selfish, nice. I asked selfishly, and then for anyone else yeah. listening, I'm sure they could check it out, so I could put them in my Audible queue. Yes. Um, I have, I have two last questions about internship, scholarship, always giving sure. back. Before I ask it, I want to point people towards agbinvestigative.com, and yes. I know you have agbinstitute.org. Um, uh, where else should we point people towards online? Any other places? Yes, agbfd.org. That's the foundation. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested to just see how what we learn and what we do for adults transcend down to young people, their children and others in the community, then Always Give Me Back Foundation will give you a great representation of that. Agbfd. Yes. Dot org. Gotcha. Yes. Okay, great. I think we've given away, Doc, so far about 50000 Yeah, it's been over $50,000 in scholarships. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about the scholarships and internships. What what impact have you seen? Maybe there's an individual story and, and maybe talk about, about the foundation and what you do there. Well, the foundation, similarly to AGB, is mission to disrupt the cycle of poverty. And we do that through educating young people um, on their role as a philanthropist in the community, on their role of understanding um, financial literacy, mm. and as well as workforce development. That's right. And so if we want to disrupt the cycle of poverty within underserved communities, we have to teach our young people how to begin thinking that way. Yeah. And so we really invest, um, the lion's share of our program is really around workforce development. And so we want to make sure that our young people are hireable and um, for employment or self-employment and what that looks like. Um, as it relates to financial wellness, you know, we have our own secure podcast where we talk about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. um, and how that's important, home ownership, um, as well as life insurance. So when we think about generational wealth, those are typically the three buckets, um, buckets of, yep. of how you can transcend wealth. And of course, as you grow as a young person, once you know you're obligated to give, and so you must mm. be a philanthropist. I love it. Yeah. They go lights again. I didn't say drone this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank both of you for your time, for what you do in general um, for society. And everyone should check out the websites, agbinvestigative.com, agbinstitute.org, and agbfd.org. And, and I want to be the first one to thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's thank a you, pleasure. It's a pleasure. Great nice interview. to meet you. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.